handcuff O.J. Simpson or to hook him up. And I'd have lied about that because he said in his testimony he never told him that. Thompson was very clear that he told him. He didn't do that on his own. But it shows this rush to judgment. Van Adder did not want to admit that and never did. We'll talk more about him when we discuss the officers together. But it seems to me the important thing for us to remember is that after this video, Mr. Simpson, you'll recall, is on his way downtown in a vehicle with Van Adder and Lang. You remember he, Howard Weitzman talks to Van Adder. Simpson gets in the car with the police in the back. Goes downtown without either his business lawyer or Howard Weitzman. Rides with the police. We know, according to the testimony in this case, he talks with Van Adder and Lang once he gets down there. I think we asked both of them about this conversation. We've heard nothing else in this, about this conversation. He has no lawyer in there with him. He has no lawyer in the car when he goes downtown. After he makes this statement to the police, which we haven't heard, he then gives a blood sample sometime around 2 o'clock or whatever that afternoon on the 13th. He voluntarily gives his blood sample. He then has a photograph taken of a cut on his finger. There's no lawyer present during all that. The lawyers are someplace else at that point. So Simpson is dealing with this himself. He wants to clear this up. He's innocent. He wants to get it all with. Everything, everything this man does is consistent with innocence. He finds out. He gets the first thing smoking. He comes back here. He goes right to his residence. He talks to the police. He goes downtown with the police. He goes in a room with the police. He has his finger photographed. He gives blood. His lawyers are off someplace else. That's what this man did on June 13th. They weren't there then. That's what he did. Consistent with innocence. They want to talk about luggage. The testimony again of this honest police officer, Thompson, is that they wouldn't let O.J. Simpson's luggage on the premises. They talk about Bob Kardashian. They smear Bob Kardashian, a good and successful, decent businessman and friend. He can't come on the premises. They have to take the luggage away. Now, these people have search warrants. They can do whatever they want to do at that point. They have the power of the state. And they have the audacity to stand here and tell you that when D retired Judge Delbert Wong brings in the Louis Vuitton bag months and months and months later, there's no clothes in it? Now, is that folly? They're not supposed to unpack it? That is silly. I shouldn't waste my time on it. But that's what was said here. You heard it. And they are the ones who turned away the luggage. So you remember that when they stand up here and try to talk to you about any luggage and they didn't have it or what was in the luggage or what was it. He brought the luggage back. And if he didn't have, by the way, that portable phone in his luggage, you'd hear about that also. So understand, we're going to talk about the facts, not any speculation. So what more then could an innocent man do? We talked briefly about... The cutter cuts on O.J. Simpson's hand. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the one cut, and these officers are there with their photographer. They take a photograph of this cut. Do you remember in those other pictures, there was a cut on the side of his finger here, or a nick or something like that. It looked like a paper cut, I think they said. And it's interesting, because if that cut had been there, June 13th, at 2 o'clock or whatever time they took it, do you think the police would have taken a photograph of that? They didn't, because it probably wasn't there at that point. So it's very interesting. This is the only cut they got. But we know that he nicked himself in several places, according to what he told Dr. Michael Batten. Ms. Clark makes a big thing about some smear or some little tiny smear of blood in the bathroom upstairs. O.J. Simpson had been back home since Friday. Shaved, whatever. I don't know when they got there. He didn't know when they got there. It would distract you as strange. That under her hypothesis, under her theory, he comes back home with his bloody shoes on, bloody clothes, with his white carpet, goes upstairs, there's no blood anywhere. So a little tiny speck in the bathroom. Does that seem to you to be reasonable or rational or related to this case? One thing about blood spots, you can never date them, you can never tell generally how old they are. Another thing that doesn't fit, the fingerprints. They didn't call them, but we called Gilbert Aguilar. You remember that. He's the fingerprint expert. He examined and dusted and found 17 latent 
Prince that he was able to lift at Bundy the crime scene, the gate, the fence, the front door. He was able to identify eight of the prints after comparing the known exemplars of the known ones being the police officers and people that you might expect around there. But there were nine identifiable prints that were never identified. Remember I asked about these various systems that you can put the prints in. It doesn't work for palms, but it works for prints. What efforts did you take to try to find out who do these nine identifiable prints belong to? To this day, we don't know. Are those the prints of the real killers? We will never know. They have not found those prints. We brought this witness in for you. We established this for you. The fingernail scrapings. Mr. Sheck will talk more about this, this EAPB. But remember, there's no literature to justify how they'd want to contort and twist this. This double-banded B is more like a B than anything they can ever justify. And it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit in their case, so they can't explain it. It's like the number four allele on the steering column. There's no number fours in this case. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. They don't and they cannot explain that. Dr. Irwin Golden, the missing coroner. This man was trashed by his own department. It was brutal by his own boss. And if he thinks he was going to be treated any better, remember how Kelberg dismissed him at the end. He said, by the way, next time you come and testify, learn how to speak slower. That was his last remarks to a man. You look at your notes. His last remarks to a man, he kept on this stand for eight days to tell us that the cause of death was stabbing. The time of death was between 9 and 12. That it could have been a single edge, a double edge. Now, that's how they treated their own witness they kept here, the coroner of Los Angeles County. But they did call Dr. Goldman. Why not? Why is that? Why are we left to speculate about that? They didn't like his testimony? He couldn't help them. It's the more logical and reasonable inference, isn't it? Whenever there's a witness that they couldn't fit within their little theory, they abandon him and talk bad about him. A rush to judgment. Detective Phillips, the very, very beginning of this case. Remember, I had Phillips as a witness. He's a nice man. And I quote him when he said, remember when he called the coroner? After all these hours, after all these hours out there, now, you remember, he's off the case by then, too, because, you know, LA, the, the robbery homicide division has taken over. They find that out at 2 something in the morning, remember? And they wait for Lang and Van Hatter to come until after 4 something. But here's Phillips still out there now. They're over at Bundy, and they call the coroner. It's like eight hours later now, as I recall. And what does he say? He's a little tape, I think, that we may have. He says, I think, quote, we're sort of breaking the rules here. They're worried about how they're going to look. They're worried about the press more than they're worried about these bodies that are still out there. More than they're worried about people traipsing through that crime scene. More than they're worried about trying to protect the innocent and pursue the guilty, which they should be doing, which they're required to do under the law. Notify the coroner immediately. Breaking the rules, not calling criminalists. This is, this is in the early morning hours. You remember that. Look at your notes. It's like 8 o'clock or so, isn't it? 6 o'clock. Now it's 8 o'clock because they're back from Rockingham. It's 8 o'clock in the morning now. His bodies were found by Risky at 12.13. Corner didn't come until about 10 o'clock. Remember that? Fung, when he does come, goes to Rockingham before he goes to Bundy. Sort of not following the rules. That's what this case is all about. Not following rules the rules. They're more worried about vanity and things like that. Not about these victims. We can demand more and should demand more of our police and it does become very relevant. Tied in with this and so let me make it clear. We heard yesterday some snide comment about well we had the best witnesses that money could buy or something like that in this case. Consider Dr. Henry Lee. By all accounts the number one criminalist in America, probably in the world. 
He didn't take any money. The money for his time that O.J. Simpson had to pay went to the state of Connecticut to help the police and police funds. You heard that testimony. So it's a real, real unfortunate thing when lawyers stand here and demean people with national wonderful reputations who come in here who get compensated only for their time. The only ones not being compensated for their time here are you. And we apologize for that. But these other witnesses, the law allows them to be paid for their time out of their offices. You heard that. I'm doing this to make money, be subjected to this, be on television every day, have people probing into your private lives. Nobody wants that. It's not any fun for any of these people. But it's certainly not right to stand here and say things like that. And those aren't the facts at all as you know them. Earlier I said that there had been an offer that doctors Lee and Batten and Wolf would assist the prosecution, not accept it, but they were out here, at least to the extent they were allowed to do things. You'll hear more about the testimony of Henry Lee on that. You remember how they rushed him to this thing when he came back from Seattle and how he was treated. That was the only time he seemed to be a little bit upset. He rushed back here from Seattle and how they treated him. This Los Angeles Police Department, that's how they treated the number one criminals in the world in their search for truth. And then, Detective Lang. Lang's different than these other detectives and things. You saw Lang for about seven or eight days. Lang is different. He made mistakes. He has misstatements, as you're going to see, but he was different. Remember that one day, and I'll tell you how you can characterize and understand he's different. It's very interesting. He's been on the stand for seven or eight days. One day he came in and he was a little different. He was a little more testy, it seemed. And I asked him, I said, Detective Lang, there's an article in the paper today. This is oh, the oh, well, it's in the record. There's an article in the paper today where Mr. Darden says that you're being too nice in answering my questions. Are you going to be tougher now? You, you know about that, don't you? He said, no, Mr. Cochran, I'm just going to tell you the way it is regardless. And no matter how you ask this man a question or what anybody would want him to say, he seemed to try and answered as best he could. Now, we don't always agree with everything he did, but it was refreshing to have somebody like that who wasn't going to be told by these prosecutors, anybody else, what to say or what to do, even when he's criticized in the paper. That was Lang, but I said I didn't always agree with him because I asked him, I said, when Risky said about that melting ice cream, now we're not Henry Lee, I mean, not by a long shot, but it seemed to me that if there were ice cream that was still melting or partially melted at 1240 when Risky saw it, and that's Risky's testimony, partially melted ice cream at 1240, but they don't bother picking up. And that ice cream, remember when you were at Bundy? That ice cream is when you go down those steps and it's on that little banister there as you're going out into the garage. Might mean then Nicole Brown Simpson went down there and was letting somebody out who'd been there earlier that evening? We'll never know. When they saw all those candles lit around the bathtub and water in the bathtub, we'll never know because they didn't bother checking. They were too worried about how they would look, notifying them, worrying about the press. We'll never know. They said the ice cream wasn't important, but it was important enough that they had, and this is the evidence, they had an ice cream melting test. Remember, I asked Lang about this again. Lang's experiment showed that this ice cream went back to Ben and Jerry's. It was Ben and Jerry's ice cream, remember that? It melted in an hour and 15 minutes. It should be totally melted by that time frame. If you extrapolate backwards, if Risky finds the ice cream at 1240 and is partially melted, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and let's say it's all melted. If you went back an hour and 15 minutes, that's 11.25. Now, if the children are asleep, Nicole's the one eating that ice cream, that seems important to us. Maybe not to them. That seems important. That's another bit of evidence. When you cannot, because of negligence and incompetence, determine the cause of death, you have to look at other things. Isn't that reasonable? Those are the facts, ladies and gentlemen. That's what happened in this case. So they tell you it's not important. We think that is important. Another factor. 
You remember that photograph in the kitchen? Where there's a butcher knife on the table, and you see some flowers there. Seems to me that when they came home, a butcher knife was used to cut whatever was off the flowers, if it was a string or some rubber band, place those flowers in a vase or whatever in that kitchen. You look at those photographs when you get a chance. And I'm always intrigued about the things they didn't do in this case, even Risky, who said, and it was kind of was refreshing, have you had any training at crime scenes? He said, well, they kind of glossed over that at the, at the academy. Remember he said that? People could have fa fallen over when he said that. They glossed over uh, training at crime scenes at the academy. And boy, was that ever more true. The first officer on the scene told us that. We knew that right early on, didn't we? It's not anything we made up. It's not about being anti-police. You saw the police you could believe, and you now know the ones you can't believe. And anybody, anybody who believes that all police are perfect, that they don't lie, that they don't have the same biases and racism that the rest of society has, is living in a dream world. So this is not for the faint of heart. This is not for the timid. As I said, this is for the courageous who understand what the Constitution is all about. That's what we're talking about here. And so, let's look at Risky, the very outset. In addition, he doesn't get any training, but he goes in the house, and the first thing he does, he picks up the phone and uses it. I said, well, didn't you think that might mar some fingerprints? Or if it had one of those numbers where you could get the last number call, wouldn't that be important? Uh, did you think about that? Well, he didn't think about that. Did you think about the fact that, you know, that you shouldn't be touching that phone and you have a rover. You have some, on your hip, some way to call. You could have used those portable phones that Phillips had with all those private numbers on them. You could have done all those things, but you didn't use any of those things. You walked in there and then you didn't notice that on that phone in the kitchen, when they're looking so hard for Mr. Simpson, that there's a speed dialer that you press a button and it says Dad, and it says Nana, and it says all the people. If they'd wanted to notify the next of kin, when they call, press the button, they could have called Nana. But not these investigators. They didn't think about doing that. They're too busy hatching a plan, standing around in the street, doing nothing from 2 to 4.30. These are the facts. This is what you heard. This is this case, the so-called trial of the century. This is how they conducted themselves. And then we come to those socks. Those socks. They just don't fit. They just don't fit. They just don't fit. Watch with me now a video. I want you to watch the time counter in this time frame. And you'll understand how important this is. Now where it says 3.13 p.m., Mr. Willie Ford says, all right, back, back it up, please. This is Mr. Willie Ford going up into the bedroom. It's 3.13, which he says is 4.13 because it hadn't been changed. This is 4.13 p.m. on June 13th, 1994. Okay, thank you, Howard. If you look at the foot of the bed there, where the socks are supposed to be, you'll see no socks in this video. And you'll recall that Mr. Willie Ford testified about this. And I asked him, well, well where, where are the socks, Mr. Ford? I didn't see any socks. So now, that's interesting, isn't it? At 4.13, on June 13, 1994, these socks, they supposedly recovered. These mysterious socks. These socks that no one sees any blood on until August 4th, all of a sudden. These socks that are picked up. That Looper says he picks them up because they didn't look out of place. I don't have any reason to pick them up. I'll just take these socks. They're out of place. The only items that they took out of that place on that day is Lang. Lang takes the Reebok tennis shoes, the ones he takes home. You remember that? That's all they really take because they don't come back on the 28th before they get that one brown glove. But these socks will be their undoing. It just doesn't fit. So they, none of you can deny there are no socks at the foot of that bed at 4.13 p.m. Where then are the socks? Where are these socks, this important piece of evidence? Well, let's, let, me, let me show you something. This board here was a board used by Dr. Henry Lee. And this is interesting. Bear with me for a moment as you look at this. Just taking uh, 
52. Thank you. In this photograph here, the one on the left, Your Honor, she didn't notice something. The socks are at the foot of the bed. If you look close at this photograph, you'll see it. There's no little white card there. You notice how they, they put these little evidence cards there when they're going to collect something. No little white card on this photograph here. And this is interesting because you see these straps on the bed. Now, Looper told us when he testified, these straps were like he called them some kind of luggage straps. And these luggage straps are down at this point, aren't they? See how they're down? And no evidence card. And the socks are there. And we come over to this photograph here. You notice how the strap is now up on the bed. It's no longer hanging down anymore. It's been moved up. And Looper says that's when he looks under this bed and he sees that photograph. By the way, how wrong can they continue to be? That's no wedding photograph. That's a, wedding, that's a photograph they took at some formal event. You look at that photograph and see. That's how they speculate. And most times they've been wrong. But this is, a, this, this, this is interesting. The strap is now up on the bed. And you look at the socks. Now there's, it's been posed for you. Here's this number 13 out here with these socks. Now, if you look back at that video, and you'll have it, you'll notice that the video has the strap down. So the video is at a time before this card is placed, before the strap is up, before this is about to be collected. Now, isn't that strange? Because at 4.13, there are no socks there. Now, how do we tie all this together? You remember, Fung and Mazzola have a log. And on their log, they tell when they collected things. They tell us that they collected the blood in the foyer at 4.30. That they then come upstairs. That they collect... Here it is as we speak. Got to move it over a little bit, Mr. Harris, I think. Do we? Now you see this. Well, they collected things sequentially, and they kept this log. And I think that you'll remember the testimony that at 4.30, they collected the blood in the foyer. Remember that? Let me see if I can point that out for us. In foyer, red stain. And there's testimony. They testify at 4.30. 16.30 is 4.30. This is, this, is, well, this is at least 17 minutes after Mr. Ford's up there with that camera where there are no socks, right? So 16.30, right there. They're downstairs. Then they say they go upstairs. And they leave this time blank. But at 16.40, they go and they look at this little red spot in the bathroom. Remember that? And they say in their testimony that the socks are collected between 1630 and 1640. So that's given the benefit of the doubt. 1635. How could the socks be there at 435 when you just saw they're not there at 413? Who's fooling whom here? They're setting this man up and you can see it with your own eyes. You're not naive. Nobody's foolish here. And then they forget about this little strap exercise. When they're posing stuff here, they move this off the bed, move this under the bed, they're going to make a big thing about this photograph under the bed. And then they put this number down here and they take these pictures for you later. But they didn't know that we would know or find out about Mr. Ford's video. See, they took that video. You know, we talked about this early on. LAPD should always take videos of everything at that crime scene. They don't do that. But they took this video. Not because they wanted to help Mr. Simpson. If anything got, was missing or got broken, this was a civil liability video. Remember, they was going around taking photographs of things that might be missing or whatever. There was ever a suit later on. But they got hoisted by their own petard again. Because the video has the counter and the number. They will never, ever be able to explain that to you. Because we got their testimony in black and white. As to when they went upstairs and collected this. Those socks from the beginning have been a thorn. It's going to bring them down. So those are the socks. These socks. No dirt. No soil. No berries. 
No trace. Nobody sees any blood until August 4th. And all these miraculous things start happening. And then, Mr. Sheck will talk more about this, then we find out it has EDTA in it. It's a planet along with that back gate. How would it be on there? Why didn't they see the blood before that? There's a big fighter. Where's the dirt? Why would Mr. Simpson have on these kind of socks with the sweat outfit? Wait a minute. Now, you, you don't have to be like from the fashion police to know that. You don't wear those kind of socks. You wear those kind of socks with a suit. You don't wear those kind of socks with a sweat outfit. Doesn't make sense to you that those socks were in that hamper from Saturday night when Mr. Simpson went to that formal event. Those kind of socks is what you wear with your tuxedo when he was dressed with those other ladies. If they went and took it out of the hamper and staged it there, then you see what happened. Is that not reasonable under these facts? I think you'll agree it is. It's the only reasonable explanation. It's posed there, and the reason for doing this is because they were out of place. But isn't that interesting? In the hamper in which Looper went and they all went, they didn't take anything else. You'd think the police would ask, Mr. Simpson, what were you wearing in addition to the suits? What, what were you wearing that night? They didn't take one thing. Yet we hear all of this talk about, wonder where the clothes went, wonder where the clothes went. You think Mr. Simpson, who told them everything, who cooperated with them fully, told them like he told them about those shoes, what he was wearing. They didn't bother collecting those, did they? No towels, no nothing. She's worried about him taking this quick shower. If he took a shower and there's so much blood and he's covered with blood, why didn't they bring the towels in here? Something is wrong in this case. It just doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must have quit. So the socks, I could talk about these socks forever, but I'm not going to because Mr. Sheck will talk about the forensic aspect of it. But let me just remind you of two quick more things. Dr. Herb McDonald came in here and he told you there was no splatter or spatter on these socks. These socks had compression transfer. And he used his hands to show you somebody took those socks and they put something on them. And it went all the way through to side three. Now with all their experts, bring people back three and four times, they never had anybody to contravene that. How'd, this, how'd, that, how'd that get over to side three? How'd it get over there? It wouldn't get there if there was a leg in the sock. Can anybody explain that? Any of you explain that? Maybe Ms. Clark can explain that. The experts can't explain it. Something is wrong. And then finally, the EDTA, which indicates the anticoagulant from a purple top tube. That's where that blood is from. The socks, as you know, is something that one can get emotional about because we've known about these socks for some time. This is, to say the least, disturbing. It's worse than that, though. In my opening statement, I told you about evidence that would be compromised, contaminated, and corrupted. And I told you something then. I said, in this case, there's something even far more sinister. The socks are one example of that. Now, if you want to be fair, decide in this case, you've got to deal with these socks. You'll get a chance to see them. Look for the dirt that you expect on them. Look for the spatter that you expect on them. Look and see why it went over the side three. There's a leg in it. And you know, isn't it interesting how you get this blood on this sock with your pants. Your pants have to be almost up. This would take a real contortion to do it. There's no way they can explain it. So let's just leave it where it is and Mr. Sheck will pick up on that. And then we've heard a lot about the so-called blood in the Bronco. And I want to tell you I'm not anything like a scientist. In fact, when my mother and my father wanted me to become doctors, I didn't because I wasn't that good in science. So I became a lawyer so I could talk. But let me tell you something. Even I know about amounts of blood, especially after this case. They tell you about all this blood in the Bronco. And you remember one of the early witnesses testified the total amount 
of blood on this console, on this console, is 0.07 of a drop of blood. Now that's a, supposedly a mixture of Goldman and someone else. So now this is, I'm going to do a little Henry Lee experiment and I hope that it doesn't uh, cause me, cause you any problems. Now 0.07 of a drop. Douglas, you're going to have to take this down. That is your young. 0.07 of a drop. 